Good morning. Oh, you got cut off again. I wonder what that is out there swimming around. Um, so we are on page 125. I'm just going to pick up where we left off and continue. From my under, what I believe we left off. My skull is one great eye, seeing everywhere at once. What a vivid image of his experience. I am about to dot, 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 become a consciousness in space, all seeing, all knowing, unhampered by material, materialistic fetters of the world. Lindbergh's description of his experience could almost be a paraphrase of certain religious scriptures. The apprehension of a greater realm beyond this one. The feeling of independence from his body and physical laws and the sense that he is acted upon by powers incomparably stronger than I've ever known arise from the same realization that pervades the perennial philosophy. Figure skater Toller Cranston described a performance when the audience was still watching intently, anticipating. At one point, I felt an electric shock run through the crowd. They understood. In that brief instant, we fused. Reality no longer existed and time became suspended. We opened the gateway to tomorrow that night and passed through. We could feel it. We could feel the birth pangs. It was something beyond love, beyond reality. And the next section is the provisional reality. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Damn it, I was at Walmart. I still didn't get Claritin. My apologies. I want to hang out with the pollen and the bugs and not get the medications. All right. The provisional reality of the ordinary world. Cranston's experience that night was more real, he said, than everyday existence. It was something beyond reality. This shift in one's apprehension and assignment of reality occurs in sport sometimes for fleeting moments, sometimes, <clears throat> sometimes for hours or days following an experience like Cranston's. I don't know what that noise is, but it's real. It's a high pitched noise. All right, here we go. This shift in one's apprehension and assignment of reality occurs in sport, sometimes for fleeting moments, sometimes for hours or days following an experience like Cranston's. Several people have told us that the world seemed like a dream. After a particularly uplifting game or sporting expedition, for a while after these events, they say, everything seemed unimportant compared to their spiritual realizations. Listening to their accounts, we have been reminded of statements by mystics and the world seems illusory after illumination. takes us to, oh my goodness. All right, it has an asterisk, but it's just like a whole bunch of words. Um, William James, the varieties of religious experience. See, especially the sick soul, page 125 through 163, and the divided self, page 163 through 186. In the collected works of Sri Aurobindo, volume 22, page 39 through 69, 
Sri Aurobindo's letters describe the shifting sense of reality in the practice of yoga. All right. This sense of illusion comes in part from a spontaneous reordering of priorities and attachments. Suddenly God or spirit is more important than one's ordinary worldly concerns. I got you, baby. We're all right. But as spiritual insight develops, the world comes to be seen as an aspect or manifestation of the reality that once seemed to transcend it. In the language of Buddhism, samsara, the ordinary world, is nirvana. In order to arrive at the sense of the divine in everything, However, one must live the right kind of life. And the next um, category section here, beautiful sunrise, is the need for discipline. Many athletes have trouble recapturing peak moments because they have trouble incorporating the meaning of these experiences into the rest of their lives. Former quarterback John Brody describes this problem succinctly. Football players and athletes generally get into this kind of being or beingness. Call it what you will, more often than is generally recognized. But they often lose it after a game or after a season is over. They often don't have a workable philosophy or understanding to support the kind of thing they get into while they are playing. They don't have the words for it. So after a game, you see some of them coming down, making fools of themselves sometimes, coming way down in their tone level. But during the game, they come way up. A missing ingredient for many people, I guess, is that they don't have a supporting philosophy or discipline for a better life. <sighs> to hold these realizations, this being or beingness, we must live in tune with their truth and practice some kind of spiritual discipline. Saint Joss, Saint John of the Cross, 1542 to 1591, he wrote this. He who interrupts the course of his spiritual exercises and prayer is like a man who allows a bird to escape from his hand. He can hardly catch it again. Just gonna sit with that for just a second, cause like, what? He who interrupts the course of his spiritual exercises and prayer is like a man who allows a bird to escape from his hand. He can hardly catch it again. All right, well, I'm gonna pause for just a second because as a person who's had a lot of birds and raised a lot of baby birds and set them free and... What? If he allows the bird to escape. I'm confused on that part. Allows it to escape. Either the bird wants you to hold it or it doesn't. And if it doesn't, then it's fixed. I don't know. Huh. He can hardly catch it again. I'm gonna tell you this. I had um, uh, cockatiels, and I had one, his name was Iggy. And, um, oh my Lord, it was hand raised and all this, oh, it was the th greatest thing ever. And um, I took it outside in its cage. It got out. And it didn't come back. And I whistled and looked for that bird. In my opinion, all the other ones that have gotten away as well, from a similar situation, um, they don't come back. So I agree with that part of the statement. If you allow a bird to escape from, it, from his hand, he can hardly catch it again. But I'm real confused as to why you had to catch it in the first place. Don't the birds just come to you? Anyway, sorry. Woo! It's early morning. I've already 
and running around. So, all right, let's try continuing on with the book. That was all just crystal side thoughts. St. Francis de Sales, de Sales, 1567 to 1622. Here's another piece of wisdom. I am glad you make a fresh beginning daily. There is no better means of attaining dot, 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 than by continually beginning again. Oh, okay. I agree with that one. That one makes sense. And the German mystic Meister Eckhart. Oh, I didn't know he was a German mystic. I tell you that no one can experience this birth of God in the soul without a mighty effort. No one can attain his birth unless he can withdraw his mind entirely from things. Holy crap, he's from 1260 to 1328. That's interesting. There can't be more than one person named Eckhart. Oh no, I have mosquitoes. <clears throat> Okay, sorry, another side trip there on the morning. These statements are not unlike the passionate praise of discipline that comes from many athletes. Yuri Vaslov, champion Russian weightlifter, told reporter Robert Lipsight, Lipsity, at the peak of tremendous and victorious effort, while the blood is pounding in your head, all suddenly becomes quiet within you. Everything seems clearer and wider than ever before, as if great spotlights had been turned on. At that moment, you have the conviction that you contain all the power in the world, that you are capable of everything, that you have wings. There is no more precious moment in life than this, the white moment. And you will work very hard for years just to taste it again. Okay, surfing champion Midjay Farley. Farley, it could be Midget. Described his passion for perfection. That is what I'm after, perfection. Give me perfect timing, perfect balance, perfect coordination perfect movement, and the perfect wave to try them on. As big a wave as possible, as long a wall as possible, the surface, the surface as smooth as possible. The wave is hollow and as cleanly peeling as possible, and so fast that I would be just able to ride it. That would be perfection. Maybe perfection can never be reached. But I hope that by practicing continually and by gaining more and more experience, I'll get to know enough about waves to leave me free to concentrate on the board. And if I know the board, I'll be able to concentrate on what I want to do on it. And by the time I've reached the peak of my surfing life, I should be able to make one movement on the board instead of two, drop down the wave face once instead of twice. You've got to regulate, moderate, and keep refining everything that you do. And all the time you keep pushing yourself, trying to push yourself right up to the limit and beyond it. Okay, on page 127 from Sport and Mysticism. We continue. Knowing and expressing the deeper perfection. You will work very hard for years just to taste it again. Athletes often give this reason for training hard and long. And work hard they must to achieve the prodigies of physical excellence that we have described. An old Buddhist story has it that one cannot achieve enlightenment until he wants it as badly as a person held under water wants air. Some athletes train as arduously as religious monastics. Top flight gymnasts practice eight hours a day for decades. Distance runners run up to 200 miles a week. Many swimmers live through agonies, both in practice 
and in competition. And weightlifters often measure their progress by the amount of pain they can endure. This willingness to suffer so much for their sport can be understood as a concentrated expression of the universal human drive to know and express the deeper perfection and beauty we secretly sense. That deeper perfection is more important to many athletes than prizes or applause. Billie Jean King writes in her autobiography, It's a perfect combination of dot 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 violent action taking place in an atmosphere of total tranquility dot 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 when it happens i want to stop the match and grab the microphone and shout that's what it's all about because it is it's not the big prize i'm going to win at the end of the match or anything else it's just having done something that's totally pure and having experienced the perfect emotion and I'm always sad that I can't communicate that feeling right at the moment it's happening. I can only hope the people realize what's going on. William Willis expressed a similar feeling when he tried to account for his sailing alone on a raft across the Pacific Ocean. I know there's mosquitoes, babies. This was not a stunt, not merely an adventure, and I did not want to prove any scientific theory or discover and set up any new course of any kind for others to follow. To me, this voyage was something much more. It was a pilgrimage to the shrine of my philosophy. Call it an adventure of the spirit. On this voyage, I wanted to prove, had to prove to myself, I had followed the right star throughout my life. Ben Hogan's devotion to practice is a legend among golf professionals. His friend and fellow player, Jimmy DeMart, DeMart, D-M-A-R-E-T, describes an episode that typified Hogan's discipline. <clears throat> oh, Lordy. <clears throat> He'll practice like no one else I've ever known. He loves to just stand there and hit golf balls. No man ever lived who has hit as many golf balls as Hogan. He won't think of going out for a round, even a meaningless one with friends, unless he's hit some practice shots. And practice for Hogan may mean hitting as many as a thousand balls in five or six hours. In the first round of the Rochester Open in 1941, Hogan burned up the course, shooting a record 64. He had 10 birdies in that score, but the poor guy took a six on the par for 17th. I had a 69, which I thought was good enough. And I sat around with the fellows in the clubhouse until it was almost nighttime, gabbing and having a drink or two. When I went out to the car to drive home, I noticed a late evening eager beaver all alone on the practice tee hitting wood shots. I didn't have to be told it was Hogan. I walked over to him. What are you trying to do, man? I asked. You had 10 birdies today. Why, the officials are still inside talking about it. They're thinking of putting a limit on you. Putting, not putting. They're thinking of putting a limit on you. <laughs> ben gave me that dead serious look of his. You know, Jimmy, if a man can shoot 10 birdies, there's no reason why he can't shoot 18. Why can't you birdie every hole on the course? And then his face took on a look of real anguish and he wailed. And how about that terrible 17th? Uh, probably has more meaning to people who play golf. I play miniature golf. That's not the same thing. Or avoidant golf. Um, the essential ecstasy, the next category. To the eye of the spiritually awakened, 
the world is filled with beauty and adventure. In the words of the Yaqui, Y-A-Q-U-I, Sorcerer Don Juan, it is brimming with possibility every minute. This in spite of suffering and discord, in spite of ignorance and general human failure. Sri Aurobindo, the modern Indian mystic and philosopher, reflects the vision of seers throughout history when he writes, There must be something in us much vaster, profounder, truer than the superficial consciousness, which takes delight impartially in all external being and enables it to persevere through all, through all labors, sufferings, and ordeals. In our ordinary life, this truth is hidden from us or only dimly glimpsed at times or imperfectly held and conceived but if we learn to live within, we infallibly awaken to this presence within us, which is our more real self, a presence profound, calm, joyous, dot, 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 of which the world is not the master. Okay. This idea that there is something profounder in us fits many athletes' reports of inward knowing and transcendence. They sense something that secretly supports the superficial being and enables it to persevere through all labors, sufferings, and ordeals. Vaslov's statement that, that there is no more precious moment in life than the white moment, and that a person will work for years to achieve it, points toward the essential inner joy Aurobindo describes. At the same time, sport is filled with a sense of play and adventure. More than anything, we think this mix of ecstasy and playfulness gives sport its hold on so many people. More than many other human activities, Sport reveals this essential truth of existence as it is perceived in the perennial philosophy. As one of the Indian sculptures says, from delight, all these creatures are born. In that delight, they live and move. To that delight, they will return. Ernest Hemingway thought the bullfight dramatized this truth. He tells us of the complete feine, the final part of the fight. Feine, F-A-E-N-A. -E the feine that takes a man out of himself. It gives him an ecstasy that is, while momentary, as profound as any religious ecstasy. <clears throat> the essential joy of sport slow, closely allied to that secret delight which supports the superficial being often emerges in the ordeal of athletic training and performance. A friend told us about a time he ran for five hours around the deck of a ship a distance he later estimated to be more than 30 miles. Um, this sounds like what he had to say about that. The discomfort grew extreme grew into pain, but I stayed with it, said that it was all right, wondered if there was anything on the other side. After a while, the pain subsided. Then it returned as before, and I climbed into it again, allowed it to be okay. Then once again, it slipped away. By this time, I must have run at least three hours in circles on the deck of the ship. I was beginning to lose touch with my body floating away to distant places. There were thoughts of grandeur and supreme power. I could do anything. Then after a long time, I began to encounter a new experience, a kind of vibrant numbness, a dull tingling throughout my whole body, as if one of my limbs were coming awake after the circulation had been shut down. There was great pain, but also 
ecstasy. I knew that I should stop, but I couldn't. I couldn't let go of that power and joy. Athletic ordeals like this, in which pain is consciously invited so that it might turn into strength and joy, resembled the ordeals of religious contemplatives. In Zen Buddhism, there are periods of practice that last four weeks, F-O-R weeks, during which a monk might sit in meditation for 12 hours a day or more. The pain and distraction that arise during these sessions are sometimes overwhelming. The depths of knowing, joy, and freedom emerge from the experience to overcome the agony. Dervish dancing rituals sometimes last for many days without stopping. Yogis may sit in the same place for months. Sport and religious practice both embrace ordeal in the service of illumination and freedom. By consciously transforming pain into delight, the athlete begins to awaken to their inner presence of which the world is not the master. Distance runners are notorious for the pains they put themselves through. Champion miler Herb Elliott says that his coach, Percy Ceruti, helped him to world records. Not so much by improving my technique, but by releasing my mind and soul, a power that I only vaguely thought existed. Thrust against pain, Percy told me. He introduced me to every book about Francis of Assisi and said, walk towards suffering, love suffering, embrace it. It's easy to see the love of play and adventure exemplified in sport, but the athlete's love of pain and ordeal is more mysterious. One key to the mystery comes with the ancient mystical insight that a fundamental delight exists within or behind all suffering. All right. We'll stop there. Because this has got a little long on us here. Next will be knowledge by identity. And it talks about Tao Te Ching, founding scripture of Taoism. The subtle body, the richness of the inner world, and exceptional powers. And then we'll have a hell of a chart here. And then we're done with five. Woohoo! All right, knowledge by identity is where we begin. And we caught a great sunrise. Or what I saw of it. The water is sparkling with little bait fish. All right, I'm gonna toss my book up here so you can see. How'd you come and remember what we are doing? Oh, we did it. We're so close. I will do everything I can to get another one finished today so we can get out of this chapter five. I appreciate you. Thank you for being with me.